Thank you for tuning into the Bo Templin Show. It is Tuesday, September 29th. It is almost 4.15 here in San Diego, California. And I just got done talking with my good pal, good friend, and my co-host and producer, Uncle Luke Domas. We broke down the NBA Finals matchups just across the board. And honestly, I feel really good about the podcast. Now, if you listened to the show last week, you will know that, um, you know, obviously it was a pretty good weekend for the kid, Israel Adesanya. You're defending 185-pound undisputed, undefeated champion and still defended his title against Paulo Costa this last weekend on Saturday and really just finished him in spectacular fashion in the second round. Now, did I predict that correctly? If I had to give a prediction of this fight, I will say Adesanya in the second round will clip Costa two, three, four times over the course of 20 seconds. It will not be a one-punch knockout. It will be a cumulative. And ultimately, I think it rocks him. I think Costa can't stand. And the ref calls it off. It Yes, but why was I able to do it? Um, you know, some people are saying on Twitter that I'm a uh, mystic guru and a, a fight genius and whatever. Adesanya retweeted the video of me predicting it correctly himself. So, video got a lot of traction, got a lot of attention. But it wasn't sluck and it wasn't um, just something out of the ordinary. Fights are unpredictable. But fighters generally are not. Adesanya likes to keep his distance. Costa likes to close the distance. And that was going to come with the price. And that's what I tried to explain to you guys in the first one. All we had to do was look for some of the clues that would lead us in the right direction. Is it a million dollar pipe? No, it's a clue. You're not going to get every prediction correct. And this one I, I was you know pretty close on. So feel good about it. But why was I able to do it? The big thing for me between the two fighters and the big difference was the resumes. This was Adesanya's 100th career win in combat sports. This was Paulo Costa's 14th career MMA fight. The difference between the two is so staggering and people wanted to pretend that Paulo Costa was this just unimaginable opponent that Adesanya has never seen before. He's never faced someone like this. You're telling me in 100 fights he's never faced someone, a big muscle guy with powerful hands? Of course he has. He knows exactly what to do with those types of people. So fighting's fighting. And what makes fighting fun is that it is unpredictable. But if you look for some of the clues, every now and then you're going to be able to kind of predict what will happen. And then the other thing that I want to talk about in this fight is just the status quo. And the status quo is that if you stand at a distance and you're unable to get inside on Adesanya, you're going to get picked apart. And even when you do come inside on him, there's a good chance you're going to get clipped on your way in. That's exactly what happened on Saturday. No one has been able to break the status quo when it comes to Israel Adesanya. The closest person to do it has been Kelvin Gaslam and provide legitimate adversity. It's the only guy who's really been able to do it. And a lot of people look at the Yoel Romero fight as this bizarre instance. No, Romero knew that if he got close to Adesanya, he would get hurt. So he stayed at the same distance Adesanya would. But neither of them were really able to engage. And you're not going to win a belt that way. So, man, I don't know how you do it. I'm not a fighter myself. I'm not going to encourage anyone to do anything. If you're a fighter, why would you ever listen to me? I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not the one eating punches and, and getting hit in the, the fucking face. So don't listen to me. But I know that in order to beat Adesanya, you're going to have to break the status quo. And I don't know how you do it yet. Guys say you can wrestle against him. Well, he has really good takedown defense. They say that if you can get inside and go to the body, that sometimes that has an opening. Paulo Costa was able to land... Two two body kicks, and and that was the most luck that he had, and this is supposed to be the most formidable opponent that Adesanya can face. Well, but yeah, thank you to everyone who you know retweeted the video and showed me a little bit of love. You know, I'll be getting back into the fight game here soon. In that last video, I covered Khabib Gaethje, and I covered Vasily Lomachenko versus Teofimo Lopez. So 
you're interested in those fights coming up, please go check out that video. Um, I'm not sure what my next fight game podcast will be related to, but I have no doubt that it will be soon, and I have no doubt that it will be good. I'm just going to continue to try and share my passion with common sports fans, people who are just kind of down to tune in to big fights on weekends. I'm going to try and explain some of the little things that maybe you're not as familiar with. But again, this episode of the podcast, it is me. It is Uncle Luke Domask breaking down Lakers Heat NBA Finals matchup. And this thing is a lot better than I think people are expecting. They're talking about this gentleman sweep. They're talking about a 4-0 victory for the Lakers. Well, the Miami Heat are here for a reason. And Uncle Luke and I break that down very clearly. So, without further ado, we may get into it. This is The Bo Templin Show. Thank you for tuning in to The Bo Templin Show. It is September 29th. It is about 3 o'clock here in San Diego, California. Um, obviously, I just got done explaining to you this past weekend of just insane fights, insane fighting styles, and uh, guys really just stepping up to the plate in big time moments and and answering the bell, right? More than anything, like it's, it's not if you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. And we saw plenty of that this weekend. Um, obviously, shout out Izzy Adesanya for the love um, on Twitter and giving me the retweet for my crazy prediction. Um, you know, I'm by no means this fight god guru or anything like that but you know fighters have styles and although fights can be unpredictable fighters generally are not generally fighters are going to come in with a similar game plan each and every time because they know what they're good at they know what they're bad at and Izzy Adesanya and Paulo Costa were no different so you know looking at that fight it wasn't the craziest thing in the world to to see uh the knockout coming and well, Adesanya delivered certainly in that second round, but early in quarantine, right? There wasn't a whole lot going on in the uh, the old sports world, so Uncle Luke and I had to get a little creative, and we were we were doing our weekly updates with the Last Dance, Uncle Luke. We had Ben Sorensen, we had Andrew Zolden, um, had some really quality conversations with them. But since then, we've really only been able to kind of catch up and, and talk about our lives and whatnot. What we have not been able to do is talk about our favorite sport in the world, and that is basketball, baby. It's just talking hoop. And, uh, well, the NBA has delivered quite nicely here uh, since they got to the bubble. So, Uncle Luke, I think it's only fair that we look at this NBA Finals, give a nice little preview, and look at what's kind of gone down here in Orlando. What do you say, Unc? Dude, I mean, holy cow. This is around the time of year where we're – we're doing the preview for the regular season, right? This is like the, this is when the NBA shows usually happen, and we're getting ready, training camps in full swing. It's all happening, and now we're talking about the finals in October. So I kind of love it. I I really hope that the uh, NBA season goes from August to, I guess September or no, it's it starts in January, ends in August, September ish. I think that you know the NBA has a prime opportunity to kind of adapt adopt this as their their schedule moving forward for the foreseeable future. So yeah. I'm all in. I, and I mean, this is, this is probably the finals. I, I know you didn't want, but, and personally, if we are going to go off of my, my, my gambling tab, I would, didn't want either, but certainly, I mean, no shortage of narratives, no shortage of storylines and the matchups are just going to be fun as hell. So I'm so excited. Well, the, I think the cool thing about this NBA playoffs and whatnot is, Dude, I'm kind of looking back at some of the things we were saying early on in this season, and holy shit, were we accurate, bro. Like, we (laughs) knew that the Miami Heat were going to be dangerous come playoff time. We knew Tyler Hero was going to be a big contributor. And, you know, three years ago, you and I were talking about Nikola Jokic being one of those top unicorn guys in the mix with AD, uh, Embiid, Giannis, and I think we even threw Porzingis in that mix, and... You know, I think he's become pretty clearly the odd man out amongst that group of guys. But early on, we knew that this dude was special. And it's kind of interesting. In in this NBA world where everything is about tempo, pace, high a high number of three-point shots being put up, you have a slow European dude who's just 
terrorizing the Western Conference. I mean, what do you make of something like that, really? Just coming in and breaking the mold, shaking things up completely and turning everyone upside down. I mean, if, if we're talking about just observations from the bubble now that we're at the, the we're in the end game here now it's a big man's league again right we we you know the beginning of the nba Ooh. you know it started with wilt and russell and these larger than life figures that kind of dominated and resided over the nba from the 60s and 70s and then you get kareem that comes in who arguably had one of the greatest long careers of any pro athlete period and and then i guess around jordan and bird and magic you start getting those wing players and the point guards and whatnot and then obviously kobe and lebron come in and it becomes a wings league and i think for the last five or six years we've we've called it a point guard league with you know russ steph and uh, james harden and all these guys who are these you know dual guard players who can kill you off the dribble and, and are you know attacking the rim and doing all these types of things that we never saw point guards do and i think we're now meshing back into the big man Realm because look, you have Ban Abadayo who has turned into maybe the second or third most important. I think he's the most important player. We'll get into it, but I think he's the most important player on the Heat, period. Um, and now you have uh, obviously we could talk about Jokic, uh, even though they've been bounced. And then you have AD, right? Like you picked Giannis, I picked AD is like back in three or four years ago when we were talking about who do you kind of want to build your franchise around and Low key, it kind of it kind of panned out for us to be like, yeah, big men are the face of the NBA again because you're asking your 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 four, your five to do the things that guards do, but also rebound, protect the paint, switch on uh, smaller offensive players, point guards, wings, and it's no secret that you know maybe right now the two best, most versatile big men in the NBA are playing in the NBA Finals right now. Are going to go up against each other. I think that's the best matchup. We've personally had of two young guys. I know AD's 27, 28, but I, I, Bam's here to stay. Like, the man is just one of the most impressive players um, I've seen. I got to see him in person back in November, which was a year, almost a year ago now, when the when they ransacked the Bulls at the UC. But, I mean, this Miami team to me has always, we can get into it, this Miami team to me has always had that swagger and confidence of a team that's felt like they've been together for five to six years, right? Like the Warriors the past couple of years, they would go into games and they could be down 25 going into the fourth quarter. And all of a sudden it's an eight point deficit. And you're like, this is what championship teams do. Miami's done that without the credibility. You know, how often do we see teams act like they can just turn it on when they haven't, you know, proven that they can actually turn it on. Miami's gotten into the bubble and they've completely turned it on. And it's because they, so eloquently adopt the style of their leader, Jimmy Butler. And it's just so much fun to watch a team, a fifth seed get to the NBA finals. You know, we don't, we talk about how the NBA is kind of predetermined destiny, but not in the bubble, man. I mean, we've had three, one comebacks. We've had a whole lot happen. So to have this become the finals, uh, the Lakers and the heat is going to be, it's just going to be crazy to watch. And I think closer than a lot of people expect. This whole bubble situation, um, it's really kind of turned favorites into like everything just feels like it leveled out, right? Guys who maybe weren't supposed to be in conversations for being uh, elite competitors come playoff time are now rising to the occasion. And then you have guys who are supposed to be playing at an extremely high level who are now falling slightly below that. Um, and it just feels like this Miami Heat team was meant to endure. This great city! It will endure. They were meant to come from the gutter and just, they couldn't be better with their backs against the wall and this bubble has just magnified that entire experience and that entire feeling. I mean, I'm going to leave the Jimmy Butler stuff to you. Okay, like I literally <laughs> in my notes here, I'm going to leave the Jimmy Butler stuff to you, but I also was able to see the Miami Heat play this year against the Clippers um, back in like early mm -hmm. February. This team has been dangerous yeah. this whole year. Now, a lot of teams, it takes them the regular the season to figure out who they are, how they're going to win games and whatever it is. But their entire focus is taking what you're good at and not letting you do it. That, and, and Spolstra might be the best coach in the NBA at exploiting those types of matchups. For me, this has been a... A Spolstra mm -hmm. mind being executed with Butler's mindset. That's great, yeah. And that has been the craziest, that has been the craziest combination. It's literally like you're molding the ultimate 
perfect offense and defensive systems into one. Um, yeah, again, I'm going to leave the Butler stuff to you, but sticking with the Bam out of bio conversation, he does everything you would ever want from your big man. Run the floor. Defend. Board. Not worry about touches. He's perfect. He's, he's this dream model Fabio of a big man. You couldn't ask for anything more, and obviously he's been adopted well into this team, and especially Jimmy Butler. Like Jimmy's now had experiences with Joel Embiid, and he's had experiences with Carl Anthony Towns. And for whatever reason, those guys weren't able to make it work. Embiid seems to kind of not uh, want to push that narrative. He seems very adamant that he wanted Butler in Philadelphia. But Carl Anthony Towns, that was not the case. It did not seem that they were getting along very well. Bam saying, you know what? I trust this Jimmy Butler, dude. I'm going to run with him, and I'm going to be his absolute muscle. I'm going to back him whenever he needs it. And then you just have the the rest of the slew of guys that we can get into. But I think Bam out of bio, um, trusting Butler, Butler trusting Spolstra, and it's just a team built on trust, and they, they, they're not concerned when the back's against the wall, no matter how deep the water gets, no matter how rough and choppy the water gets, they endure, and they just feel like they, they're bane. They're bane of this dark night rises world because they are just meant to endure. And, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that they're going to come out and, and beat the Lakers or whatever, but they are built to defend LA. Absolutely. Bam can guard AD. And, and I know you got into it with uh, King Goon a little bit on Twitter about this, but if you were to pick a team to defend LeBron James, every team's going to have to deal with the issue. Every team has the LeBron James problem. But if you were going to pick a team, Miami has to be in this conversation. You have Iggy with experience. You have Jay Crowder as a teammate and as a defender has good experience. And then Butler might be the ultimate answer to LeBron behind Kawhi. I don't know, man. Like, this is kind of what... Miami was hoping for all along. Um, the one last thing that I will leave about Jimmy Butler um, that we mentioned early on in the year when we were talking about the Miami Heat. When you put Jimmy Butler around cats, he's going to get hissed at and he's going to get kicked out of town. But if you surround a dog with other dogs, well, now you got a wolf pack. And that's what you got here with this Miami Heat team. Uncle Luke, take the floor. Dog, you you just laid it on a platter. You just gave me a bread basket, and I'm taking it, and I'm going to be buttering it up and kneading it all day. All right, where do I begin? Um, Okay, so don't let me get off track here. So let's start with the big mans that you, the big men that you brought up about Adebayo and Jimmy Butler. He's played with a slew of them. Joel, as you said, Carl Anthony, as you said. Every time I watch this Miami Heat team play, I think of the 2013-2014 Chicago Bulls with Butler and Noah. The way yeah. the way Bam operates yeah. is yeah. very MVP <laughs> Noah-ish, which is it's been so long since I've said something like that, but the way the way that offense <laughs> operates where Bam is sometimes the initiator, um at that point in Jimmy's career with the Bulls, he was bringing the ball up and and a lot like Bam does now, he gets the ball at the top of the key, and he's allowed to operate in whichever way he sees fit. If he's got a mismatch, he's gonna break you down and take you down low and get an easy two points. If uh, he's a good, he's a willing passer, but he's also a very talented passer. Being so young as a big man to have those type of hands to to see those to have that type of vision as well, he gets guys open. And obviously, Miami's done such a great job with Pat Riley and Spolcher putting this team together with Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero and Jay Crowder, who's just hasn't missed since the last decade. I mean, it's been he hasn't missed since he's been in the bubble, right? So, um, it, it yeah. He has the uh, he has the Patty Mills effect. Sure, yeah, it feels definitely. like right now where I don't know if I've ever seen Patty right. Mills miss a shot, and Crowder has that very very, very Fred Van Vliet right of now. last year, if you will. Um, so <laughs> I so I so I, I watch that relationship, and I can't help but think like Jimmy Butler's got because the reason why I bring it up because today was NBA Finals Media Day, and Vincent Goodwill, who used to cover the Bulls during yeah. those those Bulls those Tibbs uh, era days, asked about you know the guys that he you know that kind of. Does he think about the guys who kind of helped him mold him into the type of leader he is today? Because he was under the wings of Jimmy and, or excuse me, Joe and Derek and Luol Dang and all those guys. And he goes, yeah, I talked to those. are my best friends. I still talk to them. They're good friends. And they helped me mold me into the leader I am today. And I'm now nowhere near uh, where I am right now without those guys. And it just made me think like the way he, him and him and 
Joe used to play is very similar to how Bam is played. Now, obviously, Bam is ex- such a, ex- just such a much, much more refined uh, offensive weapon than Joe yeah. ever was. Yeah. But I mean, and yeah. and Adebayo, he's just got the clutch zine too. He, like he makes big plays in the clutch. That block he had on Jason Tatum was maybe one of the greatest blocks of all time. And I think we're seeing that block every single day for the last two weeks if it's played in front of you know 20,000 fans, right? And then to move on to your matchups thing, and I think this is where we're going to kind of get into the X and O's of this. I kind of did some digging because I saw, like you said, Dan, <laughs> Dan Schmidt's uh, tweet yesterday, and I, I looked at him like, you know what? Like, look, I hate Nick Friedel. I'm not say hate. Hate's a strong word. I'm not a huge fan of Nick Friedel, yeah, yeah, yeah. and kind of in his time covering the Bulls, but he kind of has a point, right? And I so I kind of did some digging. The 2014-2015 playoffs were crazy for the Cavaliers for a multitude of reasons. Obviously, lo- Kevin Love was lost early in that Boston series in the first round to the Kelly Olynyk kind of like breaks his collarbone, and that was kind of it. He had shoulder surgery. And then, obviously, the Bulls played the Cavs in the second round. It was played Jimmy. And then in the finals, that's the year that Iguodala um, won finals MVP and was you know one of the better players in that series because he helped stop LeBron James, right? Now, LeBron averaged a triple-double that entire playoffs, that series. A lot of people thought LeBron could have been the MVP in uh, defeat. And look, these guys are, you know, not that, 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 that's almost six years ago and five years ago, at least now. Yeah, five years ago now. Yeah. They don't have the legs that they used to, but it's kind of like we got to round up the Avengers to take on Thanos. Let's take the guys that we, you know, who have fought this guy before because we're going to need all the help we can get. And so I kind of looked into it and, you know. LeBron James, since 2006, nobody scored more points in the paint in the playoffs than LeBron James. The man gets to the hoop at ease, right? And in those playoffs, he took 27 – in the 2015 playoffs, he took 27 shots a game because he had Kyrie got hurt in the finals. And obviously, like I said, Love was out in the first round. But his was by far his most inefficient playoffs out of all the playoffs. He, you know, he sh- his – from – Two point field goal range, he shot forty one percent. From three point field goal range, he shot twenty two percent. His effective field goal percentage was forty four percent. The league average is sixty, for example. So that's by far the lowest number, lowest efficiency shooting wise he ever had in his career. And three of the four uh, playoff series he played against Crowder, Iguodala, and Butler. Now you have all three of these guys on your team. I'm not saying they're going to stop the man. Look, he still averaged a triple-double in 2015. He's probably going to average triple-double in these finals anyway. But if you're going to take a cast yeah. of characters, if you're going to take will. three wing guys who are going to figure out a way, you don't beat LeBron James, but the way you do beat LeBron James and his team is you make him take jump shots and you make him become inefficient. And when LeBron's efficient, he wins. It's simple as that. So that's by far my – maybe outside of the AD, bam, obviously, just for the one-on-one sake, but – I mean, that's going to tell the series right there because, look, like I love a lot of the players outside of Miami's big guns. Goran Dragic is a sneaky – if the Heat if the heat somehow do finally yeah, kind yep. of figure this out, like it's going to be because Goran Dragic is going to be getting his because I playoff Rondo is a thing, yeah. no doubt about it, but can him and KCP and Caruso handle such a savvy veteran like Goran Dragic? Because in the Celtics series, it seems like the Celtics, Celtics had the best matchups for, this, for that series. But Dragic just outplayed Kemba Walker, right? And that and that was kind of the where it started to to fall apart for uh, Boston. So I mean, those are the kind of those those are the three biggest matchups I'm looking for. And is the I guard think play you against could Dragic. probably guard play against Dragic. AD you versus. You could Bam. probably extend that. You could probably extend that um, theory of Goran Dragic outplaying Kemba Walker to the Milwaukee series as well. Goran Dragic mm-hmm. just abused the Milwaukee guards the entire time, hitting big threes, um, just absolutely running an offense. But more than anything, he was able to nullify everything that the Milwaukee bigs were doing at the time. So the Milwaukee bigs would protect the paint and then make you shoot tricky threes, or at least that's the plan in the regular season. Goran Dragic said, all right, I'm going to shoot floaters over you guys for the next five straight games and see if you guys can stop him. If Goran Dragic is hitting that same floater that he was hitting over Giannis and he was hitting over Brooke Lopez, well, this LA Lakers team is built in a really similar way. They run big, bro. They, they run two bigs at a time, and they challenge you to go to the hoop and face those types of guys. Well, the way you beat a big is with the floater, and you stop just a little bit short in front of them. And if Goran Dragic is hitting that shot off glass, doing what he does, and then hitting the timely threes, 
dude, he can really, really change this series. I, I don't know. I'm kind of honing in on him as potentially the X factor, not necessarily matchup wise in terms of the Bam AD matchup, but if I was to pick a player who could really change a series and is an out, you know, kind of an outside shot at Finals MVP, uh, Goran Dragic is high on my list, man. He's uber competitive. He just wants to win at all costs. He's got that European hoops mindset, and like, okay, so if you hoop, you know European guys from your neighborhood. And they're a pain in the ass to fucking play. <laughs> like, I don't... Like, it doesn't matter, bro. They're slow. They're not... You're convinced that they're not good. But all of a sudden, they know when balls are bouncing their way. They know when shots are going off the rim and are going to go long. And they're able to snag that shot. And they just go so slow. And they take their time. And they play such a completely different game. Goran Dragic exemplifies that perfectly. And I don't know. He is someone that I am very... Very excited to watch in this series. Yeah, I mean, I take Miami's, I take Miami's, you know, cast of of I call them cast of characters, you know, supporting cast, if you will. I'll take Miami's supporting cast over LeBron and AD's supporting cast multiple times over. I mean, I there are, you yeah. look at the rosters and you think, okay, what's Miami starting eight? What's the Lakers starting eight? Well, Miami can go nine or ten deep if they really want to to rely on guys you know they still have Derek Jones who can give you significant minutes as just that regular off the bench wing with athleticism and can just kind of change the game off of a couple of different plays that's the that's their tenth guy Iguodala is their ninth eighth eighth or ninth right and so when you have a a guy who just hasn't missed the finals since those 2014-2015 playoffs I mean that that matters in the finals. This is I mean don't get me wrong. This is going to be the the most different and challenging finals of of any NBA. I mean and just in NBA history because there are no fans. We're in a bubble. You know these are the only two teams left in the bubble, so they're only seeing two uh, one other team on a day to day basis. So it's it's all all the outside factors are crazy. But when we get on the court, I'm taking Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson and Goran Dragic. And you know Iguodala and shit, even um, Olinick and uh, Myers Leonard, if need be, because it's gonna. They, you know, these two teams are designed to adapt whichever way they see fit. And now that they're yes, both they here are. in the NBA Finals, it's gonna be so interesting to see when are we going small. When is AD and Bam gonna be the fives, and it's gonna be LeBron versus Butler, and then we just have shooters all over the floor, right? When is it gonna be? Bigs on bigs, right? It's going to be crazy between, and that comes down to coaching. And look, Spolstra is just a flat out better coach than Vogel. He out coached him in the twenty in the in that Pacers series, right? Even though the Heat were just a more talented team, Spolstra has out coached everybody so far. He's out coached Budenholzer, who was the uh, co um, coach of the year, right? He out coached, um, excuse me, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on him now. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. He brought Brad coach Stevens. Brad Stevens, who is, you know, obviously highly regarded often as one of the better coaches in the NBA. Like we talked about it in February when we kind of went through the whole Miami is good and we should worry about Miami if you're the Bucks and yeah. the Raptors, right? And back then we were just saying like Spolster doesn't get credit. And maybe now he's getting credit because he finally got to the finals without, you know, Dwayne Wade or LeBron James or Chris Bosch or any of those players from those those Heatel years. He's getting his day in the sun, and I think you know all everybody's. It, it seems like a foregone conclusion that the Lakers are going to figure out a way to win this because they have the two best players. But all the other supporting, yeah. you know, cast members and factors behind. After all that, I'm starting to lean Miami in those in, the, in those regards, right? Like you're going to have to ask a lot of Kyle Kuzma. And, Question for and you. Caruso and Question all those guys. for you, Uncle Luke. Yeah. If this series was to be played in a regular year, non-bubble, where you got four home games in L.A. and you get three home games in Miami, does that change your expectation for the series? Mm, maybe a little bit. And I would say in Los Angeles' favor. And even, and even remove Game 7, even remove Game 7 out of it and just say the three home games in Miami and the three home games in L.A., does that would that change your expectation for the series? I mean, I'm probably in the, I'm probably in the minority, honestly. Thinking, I think this is going to be like decided in our five, in six or seven games. Personally, like, I really do. I think a lot of people think this is, might be a gentleman sweep on the Lakers end again. This might be a sweep in general. 
I, I like I so. see Miami winning multiple games just because the Lakers can get up and at halftime be up ten points, and we saw this in the Celtics series. And all of a sudden, Miami all of a sudden just fighting their way back. Like you're only three Duncan Robinson threes away from it, from your ten point lead evaporating. And we've seen all year that that kid doesn't miss like anybody else, right? So. Just Miami has so many different threats that I think you have to worry about, and it's a little bit different of a challenge than they've done throughout the West. Like the West, you had to worry about just the superstars, Harden, Dame, Jokic, Murray, who, by the way, we got to have a conversation about Jamal Murray at at some point next year for sure. But um, yeah. With yeah. Miami, it's like these guys. You can kind of you you think, okay, like let's we can sit off of them because we got to worry about Butler and Bam and maybe Dragic per se. But if you if like you, we saw in Game Five, if you lay off Tyler Hero, he will put up thirty seven on your ass before you even know it. So you can't you can't sleep on these guys. Hold whatsoever. on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Tyler. If you're gonna leave Tyler Hero open, okay, I'm not guaranteeing he's gonna get thirty seven points, but he's gonna shoot enough times to get to thirty seven yeah, points. For sure, that's for damn sure. And he's okay? dangerous off that the dribble kid too. Does not even have a conscience. Doesn't even have a conscience. And the weird thing is that him and Duncan Robinson are actually really different in in one way that really fascinates me. Tyler Hero has this just uber confidence since the day he was born, right? Just swagger out his ass, does everything right. And this is exactly what we talked about at the start of the season was just his remarkable level of confidence. But then you have Duncan Robinson, who as a senior at Michigan was preparing to try and get a job at the ringer, right? Yeah. Like kind of didn't think that this whole NBA basketball thing was going to work out, but then ends up on this Miami team. And I truly think coach Spolstra has more confidence in Duncan Robinson than Duncan Robinson has I in himself. And I, to kind of cut you in right there. I mean, of the five best catch and shoot performances season and playoffs in NBA history, four of them are owned by either Clay Thompson or Steph Curry. Clay has three of the five. Steph has the fourth. Who has number yeah. one, the best <laughs> season of catch and shoot threes in NBA history? It's fucking Duncan Robinson. Man's making 45% of his catch and shoot threes. And when you're kicking out as much as Butler, even Bam off the re- off the offensive boards as well, like, Caru- like I'm, I'm worried about the Lakers wing players. Like I'm genuinely, like, I don't, I think Kyle Kuzma kind of showed what he actually is this year. You know, I think a lot of people had big expectations. Yeah. I personally thought he was going to be that third that third guy for the Lakers, and the Lakers have been basically just been like, it's not really Kuzma, right? It's we have AD and LeBron, we can we don't have to have Kuzma, right? But I'm worried about the winging players for the Lakers because they might get exposed a bunch of times this series if they're not on their assignments, and if they're not making shots, they like Miami can pour it on you very quickly. You know, they 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 can scrap and claw with the best of them. But if you leave these guys open, Hero and Robinson, you don't have your assignments in order. You know, because I'm very interested to see who LeBron guards. You're really going to waste LeBron's energy on Jimmy Butler? Because Jimmy only averages 18 points a game. Mm. Bam's the one who's leading yeah. the lay in points, rebounds, assists, or not assists, uh, steals and blocks. And, like, there's only four other guys in NBA history who have made the finals and done that, right? So, and it's been LeBron and Kidd and I think Bird, right? So it's just a, a wild, wild matchup issue for Frank Vogel because I know Spolster is going to figure stuff out. He's going to, he's been here before he's been on this stage. Yeah, he will. He's not afraid to go to Derek Jones. If he has to, I'm wondering if Frank Vogel gets in the stage and he's deferring to LeBron a little bit, just to be like, kind of need you here, pal. Right. Or is this going to, be, because it's his AD's first time on this stage too. Right. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be a whole lot for yeah. this Lakers team. I think more than a lot of people expect. Spolstra will out coach Frank Vogel. Um, we know that's going to happen. What we don't know will happen is can LeBron and Rondo figure it out in real time mm. and respond properly? Because it's going to come down to those two. And I think the third player that you want to throw into this mix, you know, Kuzma clearly not being the guy that a lot of people thought he was going to be. Danny Green, bro, he's got, like, I know he gets shit on. I know he gets trashed and he doesn't hit shots when Laker fans want him to hit shots, but. This guy, you know, championship pedigree, but you like to call it championship pedigree. He's got rounds in DNA him, bro. for sure. He's yeah, got no. championship rounds, yeah. bro. Like, yeah. he has been there, done that, 
with multiple teams, multiple systems against multiple guys. Like Danny Green is a little bit built for a series like this. I could see Danny Green kind of a little bit like there's a scenario where Danny Green kind of pops Tyler here on Duncan Robinson and says, no, 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 it's not y'all's time yet. Like, you know mm. what I mean? Let me old man you real quick. Yeah. Let me teach you a lesson. Like this is no longer that childhood pickup game you guys played. This is grown man ball a little bit. So I could see Danny Green really being a big factor in the series. Um, Uncle Luke, I had another question for you here. Who has the most to gain from this finals? Is it LeBron legacy? Is it Jimmy Butler securing a title and entering this upper echelon level of superstar? Or is it Anthony Davis who can kind of escape this... Um, it just feels like he's on that hamster wheel, playing really well every year, getting close, but ultimately falling short. But he's he now breaks out of that hamster wheel and runs with the win. Who has so the most I look at game? LeBron's resume, and the man could have retired yesterday, and you know you have a great case that he's the greatest to ever live, right? Like that's just the case. So I don't know if I you know yeah. another I think winning on finals. With the, you know, the obviously people want to talk about the Kobe narrative over and over again. Like, I think LeBron just really wants to win a finals, and obviously it'll mean the world to him to win it the year Kobe passed away, et cetera, et cetera. And this has obviously been one of the more difficult finals, if not the most difficult finals run of his career. So I don't, I look at LeBron's resume and I go, is another title really going to change my opinion about LeBron James? No. He'll be here again next year, likely. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's, his consistency will continue to be the biggest selling yeah. factor to me about LeBron is that he's there every single night. I look at Butler and I think I feel like Butler's already been validated. Like I, I feel like his his yeah. his legacy of who he is as a person, he he got wronged by so many organizations multiple times and and people along the yeah. way in his life. This is kind of a culmination of saying, "Hey, look, I woke up I wake up at 4:30 every day, work my ass off, I get after it." I'm Jimmy Butler. Like I, I proved everybody wrong. I'm here on the biggest stage in the world. I know what the final test is. I know I have to beat LeBron to do this, and that seems yeah. unlikely. We'll see, obviously, but I don't know. He, I feel like he's already won, right? If whatever he does in these finals is a cherry on top per se, and then I look at Anthony Davis and I go, we've been talking about Anthony Davis being a top five. At least I have constantly been saying like this guy has been waiting yeah. to be arguably the best player in the NBA for two or three years now. He just never in the conversation because he hasn't done in the playoffs. Obviously he goes to LA, he plays with LeBron and now he's in the finals, but it wasn't just because he was on the coattails of LeBron James's, you know, on this playoff run. Anthony Davis has really been the best Laker the entire he's time. He's been a part yeah. of this. Yeah. Like yes. he, he has made one of the biggest shots in the playoffs period. Like that was a, a gut wrenching loss because he just delivered on that play against Denver. So he has, the moment per se right now because we were talking i was talking with my buddies like how how well does anthony davis have to play to get the finals mvp if the lakers win right like if lebron goes for a casual 26 8 and 8 yeah. and they win in five games like what is anthony davis stat yeah like what does anthony davis it. have to do like i was thinking like 35 15 three blocks a game and maybe a game winner here or there right like it has to be something outrageous it might be in order for anthony davis to get it he'll have to hit jump shots because I think that's going to be a big part of the series is it, whether or not Anthony Davis is hitting one, the fadeaway like 15 footers mm -hmm. and is he hitting the three ball that's getting kicked out by LeBron? So I think that's a big part of it. If he wants to win NBA finals, he's going to have to defend his ass off. Not that he doesn't do that right. already. Like I'm, that's not to discredit. He's the number two defensive player of the year this year. Like I'm not saying he doesn't defend. It would be a tremendous defensive performance that I think could really put him into that MVP conversation. Um, Uncle Luke, I, I want to start to slowly, slowly get there a little bit and wrap this up. Why is playoff Rondo real? I, I have my own theory, okay? I have my own thoughts, and but why is playoff Rondo real? Like At this point, it is undeniable. When the playoffs come, you want Rondo as your point guard. Why is that the case? To, to answer your previous question real quick, it's Anthony Davis because all of a sudden he wins the finals. He has a finals on his resume. All of a sudden he's no doubt, without a doubt, LeBron, Durant, Kay. Davis. Like I think for me personally, Giannis is probably in there. Like, Kay. you know, it's like it, that's yeah. to each his own at that point. For me, it's like Davis has his title. Like there's 
he he gets put into that conversation quick more quickly than Giannis probably at this point. Whether that's fair or not, that's not enough for me to decide. Uh, <laughs> I hope people see your face on that one there. <laughs> But I I have seen that felt like the Donald Trump that felt like the <laughs> Donald Trump like <laughs> so I've seen playoff Rondo change my expectations on a playoff series in real time right in 2016 17 the the first round of the playoffs against the Celtics it is it is that was the time when I finally realized it was real that playoff Rondo was a thing national TV Rondo was a thing and I, the reason why I say that is like. Sure, you could talk about how there's probably some sort of way he just gets up for these things. Like, oh, it's the finals. I'm showing up. But I don't, okay. I don't, I, that's not my theory. I think obviously you could say that about any player who's ever played well in the, in the spotlight, right? I think it's just, it, 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 LeBron, or excuse me, Rondo, and this is the reason why LeBron likes him so much, operates cognitively on such a high level. And he's seen things happen way before they happen. Those types of those that, that type of decision making, when every possession matters, when turnovers can easily like you know, 12, 12 or fifteen turnovers can swing the game. So you better have the right decision makers, you know, passing the ball or making the plays that you need to make. Rondo just operates so, and he's been it, and he's been in that crunch time so many times, and he's done it, and he's and he's and it's been with multiple yeah. teams and multiple Hall of Famers and players. That he just knows where he needs to be. He knows where the ball needs to be. He he understands the flow of the game so well. He goes, Caruso's not playing well, but Danny Green's shooting well in the corner. Caruso, I need to get him the ball here. I know LeBron's got to get his in these last two minutes. I know AD hasn't got a touch in the block. Like all these things, it's it's almost like Rondo is playing the quarterback position and and on a on a basketball court. He's worrying about the blitzes. He's and that's what makes him so good at playoff Rondo or big time you know game national TV from the Rondo is because. Those decision making that like that sort of critical thinking decision making in such a high speed environment is sometimes the difference between winning and losing. And the fact that he can not just do it with his passing, but his rebounding, and all of a sudden you look up, you're like, How does Rondo have 17 fucking points in the third quarter? Right? And you're just like, all of a sudden he's got 18, 9, and 6 in in, in 12 minutes, and you're like, How did this happen? It's because he is playing a different game. He's playing. He is often playing a different game than eight other people. Than the you know the nine other people on the court. So, I think he can change the direction of this series if if it kind of starts rolling in a different direction for the Lakers. He can be the spark plug that we all thought maybe Kuzma could be. But I think having Rondo for for these finals and being healthy and and playing pretty well for, for that matter can change the outlook of this series, no doubt. So here's my theory with playoff Rondo. And Steve Kerr has actually talked about this pretty extensively. Just having Steph, Clay, and Duran on his teams, what changes come playoff time? So during the regular season of the NBA, it's about finding rhythm because you, you can't give every minute your your every last breath. It's about kind of like trying to sustain a really good rhythm throughout the course of the season and, and specifically trying to find that rhythm in games. And that's what Milwaukee does really well during the regular season. But come playoff time, it's not about finding rhythm. It's about solving puzzle pieces. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, defenses get a little bit closer in your face. Those hands are a little bit higher, a little more physicality. That rhythm disappears. Gone. Okay? You have to solve the puzzle piece of a more physical, higher contact, slower, slower. game. Okay, mm-hmm. Milwaukee runs this crazy. They run this crazy pace through the regular season. Well, come playoff time, all of a sudden teams are gonna hustle and get back on defense. All of a sudden they are gonna test three point shots that are you know kind of in in range. Well, is there a single better chess player in mm. the NBA? than Rajon Rondo. I don't think there is. No. He knows how to get guys the ball. And you know what? I'm not even sure I understand what Rondo's doing when he is on the floor and solving the puzzle pieces, but I can see him doing it in real time. I can see him doing it. And that's what I think the big difference is, is it's rhythm versus like the slow pace game. And it, it honestly does feel like boxing at times. Like during the regular season, they're just trying to throw a high number of volume, just throwing a lot of punches. Well, all of a sudden, come playoff time, you put one foot in the tire in the center of the ring, and it's telephone 
booth warfare, right? You stand in front of each other and have to figure it out. That's the big difference between the regular season and the postseason for the NBA. And no one does it better than Rajon Rondo. So and I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up about LeBron and Rondo kind of having to supersede maybe Vogel's game plans in, in some areas because yeah. Spolscher is going to throw a counter punch that is really going to put the Lakers in a situation yep. where you're just like, yep. whoa, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. It, yes. We don't know. Like, like the Miami feels comfortable playing zone. They, it is, it is their curve ball. It is their, it is their slider. It is their off speed pitch that a lot of teams yeah. are like, Oh shit, I don't know what to do. And like, look, it, it seems like the, cause, cause LeBron and Anthony Davis are so such a good tandem and so good at getting to the, a getting to the line or B just finish like AD is a great jump shooter. Right. Is that it's it's pretty obvious that you're gonna have to pack the pe- the paint on LA and be like we're not letting LeBron score inside because no one does it better yeah. for the last 15 years in the NBA has, in, in the NBA playoffs and Anthony Davis we can't just let Anthony Davis beat us on the boards you have to get those games where Anthony Davis for some reason doesn't have five rebounds and it's you know mid of the fourth quarter right you're gonna have to pack the paint maybe go two three depends on what they want to do and you're just gonna have to say like look we're gonna need Danny Green to beat us. And we have to live with that. If Danny Green's making a shot, if fucking Kuzma is, yeah. is somehow making shots, if Caruso's making shots, so be it, right? But it cannot be Anthony Davis and LeBron in the paint specifically. If AD and LeBron are hitting their jump shots, it's game over regardless. Those are the two two of the best players in the NBA, right? And maybe the two best period right now in the NBA. So, you know, you just have to pack the paint and and mix it up a little bit. Bam on uh, LeBron. Jimmy on a, you know, like they're going to do things. They're going to throw curveballs at you that you have to figure out. And I think Rondo more so than Vogel, because Vogel ain't playing. Rondo's going to be the one who's going to be solving those puzzle pieces. He's going to see what Spolstra's counterpunch is going to be. Because listen, Rondo's been against Spolstra in these, in these settings before Eastern conference finals. Like yes. it's not like there is so much familiarity yes. on the floor right now with Iguodala and Crowder and, and Butler versus LeBron, LeBron and Rondo AD. Like there's so much cross. Like when you look at the rosters, you're like, Holy shit. Like Danny green and Rajon Rondo are trying to help LeBron win a championship. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Like, you know what it is? You know what it is? Do you remember in Jersey Shore, they talked about swapping spit, like who's hooked up with who in the house and like the spider webs that are untangled? Cannot believe you're going That's here. what this NBA finals feels like right now. I 100% am. I 100% am. No doubt about it. Uncle Luke, um, as we wrap it up here, you know, go ahead. Give a prediction. I, look, what do you got I, here like, in this finals? I don't want to feel... Not that we're prediction guys. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? I don't want to like become all about predictions just as you know last question of the day um you know i i would say lakers and six would be my gut reaction i think i think the lakers who have not won a game one yet i think there is there is legitimate value if you're gambling uh addict like myself that the miami miami first game is because i think spolsha is going to come out with a bunch of different swings and and hopefully a couple of them hit and all of a sudden miami wins game one and now the lakers are forced to respond and they likely will but I, I do, like I said before, I do foresee this this finals being six or seven games and not a gentleman sweep or game, a five game sweep because Miami can counterpunch and react and come back with the best of them. And like I said, I just like Miami's plethora of guys off the bench that if, hey, if Bam and Jimmy don't have it going, Duncan and Tyler, let's see what you guys have. Goran, can you give us 25 tonight? After LeBron and AD, where, where am I... You know, Rajon Rondo, playoff Rondo's great, but like, you got to score points, man. And so I, I'm, just, I, I, I start to get worried about where that offensive production comes if Miami is able to, in some cases, either stonewall the the paint or slow down or make them inefficient. AD and LeBron. So I say Lakers in six, but I am not far away from saying Heat in seven. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't. I I wow. I I'm, I'm willing to put my myself in that camp that says I won't be surprised if Miami some if if Jimmy Butler's fucking raising the tr- and I, look I want to see Jimmy Butler succeed against LeBron James because I've spent the last decade watching Jimmy Butler get terrorized by LeBron James so there is a little bias in that in that yeah. in that prediction but I really like the Heat there's a reason why they're here and it's not smoke and mirrors like this is tried and true and tested championship DNA. I've seen it with my own two and eyes. And when you see something with your two eyes, I haven't seen the Lakers play in person this year. I've seen, I've seen what Miami can do in person. 
and it can be deadly quickly. So how about yourself? Give me, give me, I want to hear your finals MVP. Is it, is it just LeBron or bust or will we? To be honest, I, I don't think it is LeBron. Um, for, for some bizarre reason, I, if I was to go with a finals MVP, like I, again on the Miami side, I'm going with Goran Dragic. By the way, like if it, if Miami wins this thing, Goran Dragic is your Finals MVP. If it's the Lakers, like no matter what LeBron is going to put up that 26, eight and eight that you talked about, and I think it would be really easy for um, voters to give it to LeBron. Um, but just for the sake of sparking up the conversation, like. You know, Anthony Davis having his moment to shine and, and rising to the occasion and, and having big games, especially in a potential like closeout game, whether it's game six, five, if it is the gentleman's sweep or, or if it does go all seven, Anthony Davis will have to step up at some point in that closing game or whatever it is. Um, so I guess you could lean towards Anthony Davis. Um, it's a good question, though. Finals MVP could be a really fascinating conversation. Who, who, um, I would imagine. I was going to say, I was going to kind of interject onto that finals MVP. Is there a player what, what player on either side has to perform? Outside of the big guys, obviously. You, 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 I guess you mentioned Goran Dragic. But like for me personally, I think it's Hero or, or Crowder or um, Robinson that have to like have one of those games where it's like they had 32. And you're like holy cow like this we did not see this coming i'm most interested to yeah. see where does that come from on la side do we is this just is, is this is this coming I down to be like it's 80 yeah, i'm LeBron not sure no i'm not sure i see no i i don't know i have a hunch that rondo and danny green and even caruso just from a defensive perspective um i think they find a way to really slow down hero and robinson um, and I don't know, like I, again, like not anti Duncan Robinson, not anti Tyler hero. I just don't know that this is their moment yet. Um, they're young guys and, you know, usually youth is exploited with large crowds and a lot of noise. And, and that's when you would get Tyler hero to maybe like choke up, but he's made mistakes in this playoffs. And as a lot of players have, I, I could see a guy like Rondo saying like, kid, you're too young yet. <laughs> you're just you're not ready for this moment and uh yeah maybe that's just my hunch one thing though that i think this series for miami is different than the previous series at least in the opening two rounds i don't think la considers miami a cakewalk i think they totally believe that miami yeah. is a legit contender and I think that hurts Miami's chances. You know, you want to play the underdog card the whole time, and Jimmy Butler's the best at doing it, right? We're underdogs. No one believes in us. Well, when you do play well as the underdog, eventually people do start to believe in you, and you're no longer the underdog. Right. Well, that means teams are going to treat you like a champion, and they're going to treat you like a top dog and not the underdog. That could kind of not hurt Miami, but I think L.A. is coming in prepared ready for warfare. They do not expect a 4-0 series. They know Miami's going to be smart. They know that they got tough matchups ahead of them. And I almost think that that could really hurt Miami. It's a great point. They, you know, it's a great point because, like I said time. about the Iguodala and Crowder and Butler thing, there's that sort of familiarity on their side. But, look, if you're LeBron, you're like, yeah, yeah, I know those, I know those three guys pretty well. Night, uh, only one guy beat me in one of the series. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just like only one guy, and he wasn't even the best yeah. player on that team. Like I'm not scared. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? You're the, like, so no. I, I I agree. That's a, that's a yes. very good point. I, I and it's clear and obvious that the Lakers and especially AD and LeBron have had this tunnel vision the entire time. And the last thing I want to say about just the bubble in general is just like, I, I know people don't want to give credit to, I think we have this uh, societal gang mentality on commissioners and sports, right. About how shitty they are or just the bad decision makers they are and so on and so forth. Like the NBA literally drew up the blueprint for the bubble. They drew it up and then they 
went ahead and succeeded, right? No, that be outside of the, the the funny little cases of breaking the bubble and those those crazy stories that are bound to happen with these with NBA players yeah. because it's just the nature of who these guys are. Yo, shout out Magic City! Shout out, shout Magic, out Magic City! City. Oh my God, I'm going to Atlanta the moment I'm allowed to get into Atlanta and get myself some food. Anyway. That's amazing. I think I, I personally just think that like this is this was like we we talked about it at the outset. Like this will be Adam Silver's finest hour is if we crown a champion in timely fashion. It looks like we're going to and we're gonna do it without any COVID cases. That's absolutely insane. You look at the the NHL did an amazing job as well. Like I they, like I don't I I don't know the exact numbers on how many COVID cases if they had any. But the MLB football today obviously came out with a couple like there have been cases, yeah. right? In the NBA, it's been stark, nothing, and they've they've proven this is how you run it. And like it's not, and it's not being mimicked by just other sports leagues. Communities across the country are using this blueprint on how to fight this virus and still be able to to put out a product to play sports. So, I mean, just the fact yeah. that we have Heat Lakers in the finals at this at this time, you know, especially with all the social injustice stories and 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 uh, all that type of stuff that's been happening over the you know, and there's been protests and and boycotts of games and whatnot to continue to power through to be here in the finals and to be strictly talking about just hoops in the finals is is by far i mean i know adam silver has kicked out uh donald sterling and like that was uh, to me it's like just an easy thing like that it was his first six months in the nba banned for life for life forever effective immediately i am banning mr sterling for life from any association with the Clippers organization or the NBA. Burr, right? So that was an easy case for him. This this required as much imagination and creativity as it did due diligence and concern for player safety. And I just don't think there's a better commissioner in sports. And we, we talk about all the time, what's the first thing you do as the NBA commissioner? Well, my first thing I'm doing is saying, Adam, take the reins and keep doing what you're doing, brother, because it's a great yeah. product. So. Yeah, I just wanted to end on that. I'm I'm, I'm happy we're here talking um, finals, talking hoops, and simply nothing but that. God bless. Uncle Luke, thank you for the time, brother. Thank you for making this happen. I always, always appreciate brother. you. Always just love talking hoop, man. You know what I mean? It obviously, it's been you know, bizarre trying to create content and whatnot, but I think getting this finals preview out is a lot of fun. Um, I had a blast. I felt like this was just really quality across the board. Um, real quick, though, you did say that the NBA led the charge. Although he's not my favorite commissioner, Dana White deserves some credit. He has been putting out mm. fights for the <laughs> entirety <laughs> yeah. of quarantine, okay? Whether he was right or wrong for doing it, right? Whether it was on the immoral side or the moral side, Dana White's been getting the job done. Not that he's by far the best commissioner. Not that he's without his sleazy moments. Dana White's been getting it done and, and kind of put into that bubble idea first almost before anyone else. So, right. yes, the NBA's had a much tougher job because it's more people, more staff, more coaches, all of that, which is giving credit to Dana White. Uncle Luke, thank you, though, brother. This was really quality. Another uh, another great episode doing the Bo Templin Show with you, brother. All right, buddy. Peace be well. Take care,